Dave, welcome to Self Made Stories. We're so excited that you're here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I am really excited to have you on the show today. Self Made Stories um, is dedicated to helping e commerce entrepreneurs think about how to build their business. And we have people on at all different stages from they have not sold a single product. Uh, and we've had a few businesses that we've spoken to that really have, where the founder has scaled from zero um, into you know, over a hundred million in revenue. And it's really interesting when we get that type of perspective because it's, um, it represents what so many of our listeners are interested in trying to understand. Um, so excited to have you on. Thank you. Before digging into your, your business story or the, the specific one um, with Bombas, tell us your life story. Uh, so I grew up in Westchester County, um, originally in Harrison, moved up to Armonk when I was about 10. Um, my dad's an entrepreneur. Um, he's a first generation immigrant. So um, he grew up in England during just after World War II. Ended up moving to Australia, uh, moved to the United States with Royal Dutch Shell. He ended up opening a couple service stations, um, ended up selling those uh, to start his, you know, his passion project, um, which uh, if, you, if you ever see wood chips on playgrounds, uh, my dad invented the safety system that utilizes wood chips on playgrounds. And it's a funny story because you know, when I was going through my entrepreneurial journey, uh, we were t- I was talking about fundraising and all this stuff. He was like, I don't get it. He was like, don't you just save some money, put it in, you know, invest a little bit. My dad started his business with $5,000 in like the basement of our house, you know, like the old way that businesses used to be done. I got exposure uh, through that. And, you know, my mom was always incredibly philanthropic. And, you know, she stayed at home and did an incredible job raising two quite hyperactive ADD children, um, three if you include my father. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't until uh, 10 years after I was born that my mom was, uh, I think, given the gift of my little sister, uh, which I think was the, um, I think her all of her efforts, you know, were paid back through my sister's super calm, you know, wise beyond her years and uh, just a great kid overall. Not a kid anymore, she's an adult now, but... Um, so yeah, I grew up in Westchester, um, you know, and I think in early days, I think before I even knew what entrepreneurship was or, um, you know, I was the kid in the neighborhood who, you know, would walk dogs or, wa- you know, wash cars or clean gutters. I kind of just walked around always asking people if I could do things uh, for money um, because I wanted G.I. Joe's or Ninja Turtles and my parents said if I wanted it, I had to earn it. So I think they instilled that from me from a very early age. And then I think, you know, some genetic aspects, you know, not shy, I'm quite outgoing, um, you know, not afraid of kind of failure in in any of those senses. Um, So grew up in Westchester, um, went to high school in in Armonk, and then I ended up uh, going to business school at Babson. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that I, you know, I looked at a bunch of different schools and it's kind of the thing where like, I stepped on the campus and I was like, this is the place for me. And this is back in, I, I, I went to Babson in 1999. So this is really pre the like entrepreneurship, startup movement. You know, we didn't have Shark Tank. We didn't have How I Built This or Self Made or, you know. 99, or, that was beginning of business school or was it the beginning of college? Well, so college, I went to Babson undergraduate. Like a, okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Babson's undergraduate business um, with, a, with a heavy emphasis on entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in high school, I'd started a mobile DJ company. And so I kind of had always known that I, I, I a wanted A mobile to, DJ company? Yeah. So say more about that. Among all of the varied interests that I had uh, as a teenager, um, I, somehow I wanted to be a DJ. And I wanted to buy all this equipment. And I think it cost like 2000 to get like the turntables and the speakers and the mixers and the amps. And, you know, of course, when I asked my parents if I could buy all this, you know, they were like, nope. But you can find a way, you know, if you want to save some money. And I was like, I don't know, how the hell am I going to save, you know, 15 years old? How am I going to save $2,000? I, I work at the Gap, you know. I'm not going to barely make that in a, in a year. So I, I convinced them to loan me the money. And I had come up with, I was like, look, I'll go DJ kids' birthday parties. And um, so for, you know, the four years that I was in high school, I uh, had a my a mobile DJ company, my mom would drive me uh, when I didn't have my license um, to a bunch of these 
seven-year-old, you know, birthday parties and, you know, I'd play some music and I'd leave and, yeah. I Did you do I, bar mitzvahs? I didn't do, I was not that. Uh, so it was just, it was like. This was like a, you know, 200 bucks for four hours type of thing, you know, in a, either like a rec room or someone's basement or. Wow. Uh, what were some tracks that you would play? Um, I think, I think there was a lot of Britney Spears. Um, because I had to play to the audience, of course, mm-hmm. right? You know, seven year olds, ten year olds, um, in sync, you know, Backstreet Boys. <laughs> this is <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right, so you got the mobile DJ company, Babson. You can step foot on the Babson uh, yeah. campus. Small school, 1200 undergrad, which I think was really good for me. Uh, I was growing up with a learning disability, um, you know, with ADHD and a slight form of dyslexia. I think going to a school where my largest class was 25 students. Um, The professors all knew our names. They knew if you were in class, uh, I think was really important for me. Um, And it was an incredible education, super focused on a lot of the topics that I knew that I would use someday because I knew I wanted to be in business and follow the footsteps of my dad. And, um, but I, I just had a super call, you know, big calling towards entrepreneurship. So, um, Graduated from Babson um, through the four years. Actually, one of the other formidable, I think, parts of my uh, journey is through the four years of Babson, I sold Cutco knives. Um, you know, it's like the door-to-door yeah. knife salesman thing that you know some people do. Um, I ended up being one of the top salesmen in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. I sold over four hundred thousand dollars worth in four years. Uh, I made about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in my four summers of wow. working through college. Uh, and I was working four hours a day, four days a week, and all my other friends were doing internships at Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, and you know all the places that no longer exist. Um, you know, getting coffee and running around. And I was selling knives to housewives in uh, Westchester County, um, you know, making way more money than they were living a much better lifestyle. My father, who um, was a door-to-door salesman selling encyclopedias Mm -hmm. um, when he was at that that age, describes learning how to sell as the single most important thing that you can experience and to prepare you for business. I 100% agree. And why, why is that? I don't know what the, what's the old adage about like it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. Um, because there's so many at bats, right, with these things, they're like, you know, between 30 and 30 minutes in an hour that you're kind of doing these pitches and, you know, you're typically doing eight to 12 a day. Um, and in the earlier days, you're, you know, you're working seven days a week to kind of like really ramp up your business. Um, you start to learn what works and what doesn't and, you know, human dynamics and what motivates people and how to kind of, um, I don't want to say manipulate in a bad way, but like manipulate people to be interested in, you know, and there's just like the, the general human uh, behaviors that you start to pick up um, that I think actually start to apply throughout life, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, if you do have aspirations to be an entrepreneur, you know, you're always selling. You're selling a vision, you're selling a dream, you're selling the product, you're selling your employees on, you know, working there, you're selling investors on why they should invest, you're selling your customers on why they should buy. Like, you're always, always, always selling. Um, And so, you know, figuring out or having honed that skill really early on, and I think for anybody who's younger listening to this, you know, the Vector Marketing Organization, which is, you know, what what they sell, Cutco, they have honed the like the skills down to such an un- for training a science. Yeah, I mean they are again because if, if you're if I was doing it for a few hundred hours, they have people who have done it you know for thousands of hours. Do you remember your pitch? Uh, I knew that it started with uh, you know uh, like thanking them for my time. You know I'm a college student. I'm working my way through college, and you know you opened up and said, you know, we support the food bank and, you know, what if I told you that these, you know, k- kitchen shears could cut a penny and then you cut the penny into a, into a thing and that kind of gets them excited and you start to build up the value of like, you know, if I, you know, in stores, something like this would cost, you know, 1200 but what if I told you that it was only 600 right? And so you build the value, offer, you know, a lower price and, you're constantly always like making sure that you're handing the product to them. And there's like some psychology around if, if, if anybody takes an item and like puts it in front of you with their hand, if you don't 
their, their natural instinct is to grab it. Mm-hmm. So now they have the product in hand, they're holding it, they're feeling it. You get them <laughs> to cut some rope, a tomato, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, there are these silly little things too about like you take the knife block and, you, you know, you're in someone's kitchen and you're like, let's put it over here. And you'd put it on the top of the microwave and they'd go, no, 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 it would never go over there. And then they put it where they would see it, envision it. So now they're imagining that these products are in their home and where, how they're going to use them. It's all these like really subtle, fun things that. That's amazing. You just, you just, you like got their interest in terms of you as a person, in terms of like the impact the knives would have in terms, I mean, that, that's fun. Okay. All right. I know that we're going to get to Urban Daddy at some point here. At some point. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Keep going. So, uh, so when I graduated, um, you know, coming out of sales, I was, so pa- I was so passionate about sales. I loved it. I was good at it. I was making a ton of money doing it. And so, you know, I think as any uh, young, freshly out of school, uh, you know, 22-year-old, you know, and when you're broke, you know, you're thinking, about like, how do I make money, right? How do I make the most amount of money as quickly as possible? And so I... Like did some research on industries where in sales you could make a lot of money and software, you know, seemed to like kind of top out like enterprise level software. Um, and the way that you got into that was you started in inside sales and then you would move to outside sales and then hopefully you'd build up a resume. And you know, I was I was speaking with people and networking and you know I knew people who worked at SAP making you know two million bucks a year as a salesperson and I was like, holy shit, like I'm good at sales, like I can do this eventually. Um, what I didn't realize is that you it's quite important to connect with the product you're selling. Mm-hmm. So I went and I did about three years of, of software sales inside and then outside and in technology. Um, and I just don't like technology. Like enterprise sales, and you're talking with data architects and CIOs, and you know, it, it's just not for me. It's not a language I speak. It's not intuitively you know, interesting for me. Um, so I was at a company called Data Synapse. Um, I ended up, I made a lot of money you know, for a couple of years. And uh, I was just like, you know what? This is not for me. I'm going to leave. I want to start my own company. Um, so I started my first company. Um, I don't know if you can call it a company. It didn't make any money, but we sold it. So uh, for kind of break even, maybe a little bit of a loss. But uh, so I was living in a huge apartment building here in New York. Uh, I think there was something like 1,200 people living in the building, two towers, one of these kind of Murray Hill, uh, you know, graduated dorm, you know, college dorm room type of uh, living situations. And uh, I'd just broken up with my girlfriend from college, and I wanted to meet the girls that were living in my building. But I, you know, in a 10-second elevator ride, I had no way, you know, no confidence or swagger to, like, really introduce myself and try to get their numbers. And so I was like, why isn't there not? You know, I was like, we have Facebook for college. Why is there not like a social networking site for apartment buildings? Um, so I worked on that for uh, about a year and a half. Again, I, I think this was my first lesson in, in entrepreneurship where it's really important to think about how you're going to actually make money uh, before you just run and pour mm-hmm. a bunch of money into an idea. Um, and so eventually I'd kind of invested about $50,000 into this platform and, um, I had no idea how we were actually going to, we had users on the platform and people were using it and they liked it, but I was like, oh, how, how the hell do I make any money? Um, so I ended up shutting it down because it just ended up being a, a cash burn for me personally. And this was, again, pre the days of really thinking about going out and raising money and all these things. So that's when I was like, I like online. I like digital. I think that this is, I need to learn more about this. And so uh, I ended up applying for a job at Urban Daddy, not really knowing how big it was. And um, I interviewed and they ended up hiring me and I was the seventh employee there, uh, which is ultimately how I met my co-founder, Randy, who was the sixth employee. So our chairs kind of uh, you know, touched back to back. And uh, over the years of being there, we, we formed an incredibly uh, strong friendship and, and you know a shared passion for entrepreneurship. And um, a lot of the things and experiences that we had at Urban Daddy, growing the company from seven people to 150 people, um, both the good and the bad, uh, I think helped us lay the foundation for ultimately what would be Bombus. You know, n- not the idea, um, but but how we wanted to build the company uh, from a cu- from a culture standpoint mm-hmm. and just uh, you know 
setting goals and vision and core values and mm-hmm. you know some of the businessy school type of stuff but in application we saw were super super important mm-hmm. did you manage emory there i did yeah yeah so there's two two people from my first company that you've come to uh so emory, emory was a good friend of mine and i hired her um when i left she took over my position yeah. and then you hired her yeah. away from urban daddy and she was a phenomenal salesperson or is a phenomenal she's unbelievable yes yeah, unbelievable I think I know part of this because you shared some. So Urban Daddy, you started learning about traffic, mm-hmm. brand. Content, the important, the important of storytelling, yeah. uh, which was really Randy's forte. Like he was head of brand. What, is, what was Urban Daddy? Because a lot so, of people may so, not know. Yeah, so Urban Daddy was a daily email newsletter, um, hyper-localized to specific cities, uh, specifically targeted towards the male audience. Um, highlighting the one thing that you needed to know in the city every day related to lifestyle. So whether it was the newest restaurant that just opened up, whether it was uh, you know a new nightclub um, or you know some cool new store uh, or some really interesting experience, um, you know Urban Daddy was incredible at scooping these stories and, and breaking them really before anybody else would and. Um, you know, we were known for kind of like crashing or, you know, crashing certain businesses on kind of day one. This is, um, I, we had this experience with Urban Daddy, actually. Yeah. yeah. How, with, how about, we, we yeah. you guys picked this up and then our, the site just crashed within like five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, we, for, for those of you that remember Daily Candy yeah. or Thrillist, it was in that genre, right? One newsletter a day, one story a day. How did you decide to do Bombas? So, um, you know, ran, over those years that Randy and I worked together, um, we always kind of talked about starting something together. I think we really enjoyed our friendship, and I think we realized that we thought about things the same way. And so during that time period, we kind of just kept our eyes open and our ears to the ground, um, looking and trying to develop ideas that maybe one day, you know, would turn into something. Um, and totally again by chance is a lot of the way these things happen um i was scrolling facebook one day and i saw a post on uh that somebody had made that said socks are the number one most requested clothing item in homeless shelters and this was february 2011 um and so to give some context uh tom's was in their fifth year of business uh warby parker was about six months old so relatively new Um, But there was this kind of really energized movement around social impact and business and one for one and give back. Um, And so when I saw the quote, I didn't immediately connect the dots. Right. I was just like, oh, that's like sad. Right. Like something that I've never spent more than a few seconds a day thinking about um, can be perceived as like a luxury item for somebody else. Um, And so I remember walking over to Randy's desk and I was like, I was like, I just learned that socks are the most requested clothing item at homeless shelters. And I watched like a similar reaction on his face. And he was like, huh? He's like, yeah, that's pretty shitty. That's like sad. Um, and I don't think like we, we didn't were like, oh my God, let's start a business. Right? Like that was not how it happened. I think it just, we let it kind of sit and marinate with us. And, um, you know, going back to the, you know, we obviously followed entrepreneurship and, you know, what was going on in, in the world of startups and, you know, once we started kind of hearing more about Tom's and Warby, that's when I think for us the idea started to like, oh, like if they can do this for shoes and they can do this for eyewear, you know, maybe we can do this for socks to help solve the sock problem. Not thinking there was, you know, like figuring out the consumer side at that point. Um, but we said, you know, we're like, okay, if we're going to donate a lot of socks, we need to sell a lot of socks. And if we're going to sell a lot of socks, like we've got to create something that's like super awesome and interesting that goes beyond just the donation model. Um, So we started doing a ton of market research and looking for the white space. And, you know, at the time, there was kind of this like the upstart of this movement around men's dress socks and kind of the more, you know, business side of the world where, you know, men were wearing funky colors and patterns and stripes. And it was really kind of being disruptive as a way to kind of express yourself in an otherwise, you know, um, pretty boring um, fashion sense. but we were startup guys, right? We were wearing sneakers and jeans to work every day. And, you know, but, but we also were, worked at a men's lifestyle publication. So we cared about fashion and product. And, um, you know, Randy ran our like men's fashion blog at, mm-hmm. at Urban Daddy. So we kind of both looked down at our own two feet and we're like, okay, well, what do we wear? And we were like, 
all right, he's got on socks from Costco. I've got on socks from Uniqlo. And neither of us were like incredibly passionate about it. It was just kind of like this afterthought type of item. Um, so we went out to the marketplace and looked at the other kind of what, what would be termed as like athletic socks, mm -hmm. not performance, but like the general athletic sock that you go and you could go to Costco, buy a 12 pack of Hanes or whatever. Um, and we realized there was this massive gap um, there was the low cost mass market, um, you know, low quality product, which, you know, most people were buying. And then on the performance side, there were these individual, you know, niche centric products that were um, incredibly innovative uh, with tons of features, but were costing 13 to $36 a pair. And I was like, well, what can separate a $36 pair of socks from a dollar pair of socks? So... As the more and more we started to like wear these hyper technical products, we realized there were things like seamless toe and arch support and comfort footbed and articulated heels and you know performance fibers and you know the way that the sock was shaped and you know would, would just feel a lot better, it would just make every day a lot better. But they were geared towards runners and cyclists and basketball players and hikers and the most extreme versions of whatever sport they were trying to uh, participate in. But yet, as a consumer, just walking to and from work or, you know, around the office or doing whatever it was that I was doing in my daily life, these improvements I found made a big difference in just my overall comfort. And so that's when we had the kind of, you know, aha idea for the product, which is let's take all of the innovation that's happening in this super niche market and bring it and put it into a package and design uh, and market it with a story that gears it towards the mass market consumer. Um, you know, one of the one of the parallels that we constantly use for for what like how we developed Bombas was we kind of looked at like what Starbucks did for coffee, right? Took a highly commoditized product, something that you know most people were drinking Maxwell House or you know going to their corner deli to get a cup of coffee for seventy five cents, and you know here Starbucks comes along, offers an incredibly high quality product with a much better customer experience. And they're convincing the consumer to spend three to four times more on that one product per day. And that was our general thinking with, with socks. Here was an item that you know, cost a buck you know, for most people uh, per pair. Um, and you know, if we could ingest a ton of innovation you know, and sell it for you know, 10 to $12 a pair, but tell them why it was important to, to spend up, it wasn't a massive jump from them, uh, for them um, from an actual dollars perspective to grasp it. And, so we ended up, uh, you know, working on that for two years, um, product development, wow. um, building the brand, really thinking about how we were crafting the story, and then ultimately decided to launch in August 2013 on Indiegogo. Cool. You just walked through, in the, the, like, an amazing sequence, the set of things that we talk about all the time. We, we created this... Um, basically a series of nine principles of building a healthy e-commerce business mm -hmm. where the first three are really about like the mission of the business um, that starts off with the white space that you're identifying. And I think that it's the way you just broke it down is really interesting in terms of price and product innovation. Uh, I, I think a lot of people think that it needs to be around like the consumer psychology and you need to get there, but in some ways it's like start with like what's the category that you're in. Totally. And then what are the what's like what's really truly out there and what are what are what's room in that context? Yep. I think a lot of people think that direct to consumer means take a product that is expensive at retail, find a way to cut out the quote unquote middleman, mm -hmm. and that's gonna be the value prop mm -hmm. for the end for the end consumer. But the that yes, that does apply for things like eyewear with Warby, right? Or Casper with mattresses. But in our category, it was commoditized. So it was a cheap product already. Mm -hmm. And where we came along was like innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where, you know, that, that's the other formula that I think works. And, and we charge more um, than what I think the average consumer is used to paying, but we tell them why it's important. Another piece of what you described is just two years of product development. Um, I, would, I think is another thing that we don't always fully get just how long it takes to get the product right. Totally. And so can you just talk a bit about that time period? I mean, you have been a little bit about a bunch of things around socks that most people don't understand yeah. at all. 
but you started learning everything that there is about socks, trying on tons of pairs of socks of like high performance socks. What else were you doing to sort of figure out? Well, this is it, right? Like I didn't come out of manufacturing, right? I had no exposure to, I've never created a product in my entire life. So here I was wanting to create something. I had no clue where to start other than thinking of myself as the consumer, right? And trying to understand what did I want that was not, that I wasn't finding in the marketplace or wasn't being marketed towards me and talked to me as the way that I was as a consumer. Um, so that's kind of how I started, right? It's like, I was like, okay, I need to understand everything there is to know about socks that I have exposure to, right? Because I'm not in the business. So I just go to the store and start buying a bunch of things and figuring out why one thing is, you know, more sells better than another thing and talking to sales reps and figuring out, you know, which of these products moves the best and why do they move the best? Well, because they have this, you know, special yarn that wicks moisture and the people really love this feature, but also people love the ventilation that's on this one. So like I tell people that if they want something that's going to breathe really well, they go here, but if they want moisture wicking here and I'm like, okay, well, what if I combine those two Mm -hmm. things? Right. And so I started to pick up on all the things that I was finding out just from what I could find out as a consumer um, that was important. And then I would start to hook and pull these things together. What was the, the, the process of figuring out actual manufacturing like? So this is the part of my story where like luck plays a huge part in it. Um, I remember early days, I told my dad, who's an entrepreneur, you know, over dinner one night, I was like, I've got this idea for a sock company and, you know, we're going to donate a pair. And, but I was like, I don't really have the first fucking idea how to make these things. And he was like, you know, your godfather was in the sock business for 40 plus years um, and did really, really well. But I can't remember by any capacity what he did exactly. So I called him um, and I went to go, you know, meet with him. And it turns out that in the late 80s, early 90s, he was president and CEO of a company called Gold Toe, um, which <laughs> everybody, most people know. Uh, it's like the sock with the gold toe. Um, billion dollar plus brand uh, globally. Um, he left Gold Toe and then started a private label sock manufacturing company. He was actually one of the first private label sock manufacturing companies. Ran that for 20 years um, and was making product for you know Calvin Klein, you know Nike, um, Walmart, uh, kind of the whole gamut. He, what's his name? Your godfather? Uh, Steve Lowenthal. Steve Lowenthal. He's like, let me tell you how to make socks. Yeah. And the joke <laughs> is that we always say, like, we call him, like, the godfather of socks, right? <laughs> he's my actual godfather, but, like, he's also, like, the godfather of socks. So I went with him. I went to him, and I was like, okay, so how do I make a sock? And he was like, well, what do you want to make? And I was like, I don't know. And he was like, okay, well, go figure out what you want to make. And when you come back and tell me how, you know, like, what's your vision for the product, I'll start to connect you with different manufacturers that I've had, you know, decades of relationships with. And he really, he really ultimately ended up opening the door to some of the best factor. I mean, it is basically kind of the equivalent of like, if, if Steve Jobs was your godfather and you wanted to make a tech product, right? Like he would walk you into Foxconn or whatever, these huge manufacturers that would never probably return your phone call other than the fact that you had this connection. So mm-hmm. because I had this legacy, you know, in my, you know, not family, but, but connected family, um, he really opened up those doors for us. And they worked alongside us with no financial commitments, no purchase order commitments, um, they did all the product development with us as really good partners. And we still work with, you know, the, the main factory we ended up working with then is still our largest factory um, to date. Um, and so, you know, they invested in us. They really kind of took a chance. Um, and But because they were one of the leading factories in the wow. world uh, for sock manufacturing, um, you know, I just tapped into a gold mine of, of anything that I wanted to do. Um, but it was an interesting process because... You know, I think, I think when we look at kind of the revolution that we're kind of living in right now, where um, you know products are being disrupted in spe- specifically in kind of the consumer space. Um, you know, you look at Harry's and you look at you know a lot of these other uh, you know like Away and these other direct to consumer brands. Um, a lot of the ingenuity that came out of the product came from the fact that all of us didn't come from a manufacturing you know, and product development background. We came at it as consumers. Yeah. And we were really coming at it and saying, what is wrong? 
I want to fix it. This is how I want to fix it. But it's funny because I, I remember distinctly, I was like, I want to put a seamless toe on a athletic sock. And the factory was like, why would you do that? They're like, seamless toes are reserved for like luxury Italian knit dress socks that cost $35 a pair. And I was like, yeah, but as somebody who suffers from hypersensitivity, my whole life that fucking annoying toe seam has always dro- drove me insane. And they're like, but it's way too expensive to put on, a, on an athletic sock. And I was like, well, what's too expensive? And they're like, three cents a pair. And I was like, what? I was like, I can get the consumer to spend three cents. Like, they were so used to the, yeah. the Walmarts and the Costcos of the world saying, like, give it to me for as, like, my godfather was producing socks that literally cost less than a penny. Like, the joke in the sock business is you have to talk in terms of dozens because you can't, because they're so cheap. Like, you know, the stuff that you're buying at, at all these other places are so cheap because of the qual- product, the quality of the materials and the, you know, innovation that, or the lack of innovation that they're putting into it. You know, they're just, they're trying to get to the, like, bare minimum of, like, what would even become a viable product mm-hmm. in, the, in, in the consumer's mind. And so I pushed them and I was like, no, like, do this, you know, put an arch support in, put comfort bed, put bed. Let's use long staple Peruvian cotton. Hold on a second. You have hypersensitivity. What does that mean? So, so a lot of kids with ADD or ADHD, um, you know, tags and shirts, you know, we're the, we're the kids that can like feel the smallest that like a pebble in the shoe. Mm -hmm. Like it'll, most, most people can like tune those things out. We like become so hyper-focused on them. Um, so it's, and what was the thing that always got you with the, the toe the, seams? What are toe? So seams? you know that annoying that like the seam that runs across the top of your sock yeah. that like the thick you like you yeah. know when when you have to like you put it in your shoe and then you take your sock your shoe your sock out of your shoe and you like try to readjust the front so it doesn't like it's got a little extra like sort like, of big nub. part by the by the exactly big toe. Yeah. exactly and you're trying to move that around that's the toe seam. Gotcha. So I wanted to get rid of it and the only product that that didn't have it were these like super high-end mm-hmm. italian made dress socks because they're super thin fabric so a toe seam ex- is accentuated on a thinner fabric so okay we're, we're laying the table here of all the various things that lead to what becomes a big success there's a few other things too like how did you think about um acquisition costs shipping costs price point thing like sort of like i feel like we got brand products passion, manufacturing sort of connection, yeah. a bunch of different ingredients yeah. here, but there's a few others. Let's just list them out. Sure. Then take us up to today. So on the fulfillment side, which came first because we didn't do marketing for the, we didn't do paid marketing for the first year. Um, fulfillment side, we launched this Indiegogo campaign. It was a yeah. massive success, uh, way more than we thought. We, you know, we thought we'd sell $15,000 in 30 days. We sold $150,000 in 30 days. So we had like 4,000 orders we needed to fulfill. And, you know, I think we, we, I looked at kind of Randy and some of the other people that were there in the early days and we're like, we did the math and we're like, in order to fulfill these, the four of us are going to be sitting in a garage in September for three weeks straight, 12 hours a day, packing socks. And that sounded horrible. Mm-hmm. So I started reaching out to people and I was like, well, what do you do? Where do you start? And, you know, I had a really good friend who, um, was the co-founder of Birchbox, uh, Haley Barna, and she was like, "Oh, you you, know, you get a three PL or a distribution center." And so, you know, we started. Obviously, we couldn't use ones they were using. We weren't that scale, so I started look, calling local three PLs and just learning about, you know, what does it cost to pick it and pack it, and you know, how does this whole thing work? And they educated us. Mm-hmm. So again, leaning on experts and and people who kind of been there before, trying to tap into networks and really understand the things that we didn't understand. Um, and I think that just the common thread with any area in the early days is I think we were truly, brutally honest with ourselves about the things that we were good at as well as the things that we weren't. And the things that we weren't, we were either going to try to educate ourselves, but if it was too complex, we would hire or, or try to bring in advisory counsel and, and compensate them with mm-hmm. either equity or whatever, whatever form that we could in those early days. And so leading to acquisition. So once we had you know, launched Indiegogo, we realized, okay, there's product demand, you know, people like the brand, you know, um, let's ship out the product, get it to them, and then see what happens as our kind of next phase of proof of concept. And this is an important thing because I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs now that come and seek my advice and, you know, 
there, I've got this idea. I want to raise a million dollars, you know, and da, da 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 And I'm like, okay, well, do you have any revenue? And they're like, no, it's pre-product, pre-revenue. And I'm like, well, go ahead and grind it out a little bit, right? Like, don't just assume because you can put a piece of an idea on a piece of paper and like draw some like fun packaging, whatever means that you can go out and raise a million bucks. Like, taking other people's money is a massive responsibility, and so find ways to use things like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, you know, go run trunk sales, you know, just hustle it out a little bit. And that's the thing that I think, like, I think in, in this kind of revolution, everybody just like, I've got an idea, I'm going to go raise a bunch of money. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the VCs have, have encouraged that terrible behavior mm-hmm. um, where, you know, we're losing the grit and the grind. So we launched Indiegogo, shipped the product, wanted to see what customers thought. I had people, like friends that were like, I love it. Can I give you some money? Like, I want to be a part of this. And I was like, I don't want that stress. I don't want that pressure. I still need to figure this thing out a little bit more. So we shipped the product. Customers come back. They rebuy a lot. They gift it to their friends. They tell their friends about it. We do another $150,000 in the two months following uh, the close of Indiegogo. And how did that happen? That just through repurchasing and gifting? Repurchasing, organic, gifting, and word of mouth. Wow. And we, we tapped into some of our, our our network from our media relationships from Urban Daddy. So we had friends at GQ and Esquire and, you know, um, Uncrate and some of the other uh, consumer mm-hmm. publications that mm-hmm. gave us a little bit of press. Um, but mostly, no, it was, it was a lot of customers that got it, fell in love with it, and then told their friends about it. Or because it was a cheap enough price point, wanted to gift a pair to their mom or to their sister or their doorman or their you know pharmacist, whoever. And so early 2014, we decided to go out and raise some capital. Got it. Um, early 2014, um, we saw some, some success and some early momentum, and that's when we said, okay, let's go out and raise some capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, originally set out to raise you know $250,000 from friends and family. Um, and then through the course of the next six months, uh, the demand for and the interest um, just from being referred to other angel investors and different networks, um, ended up we ended up closing a million dollars of seed funding. It's funny at that time I'd also you know following some of the advice of some of my other friends who are you know entrepreneurs, I met with all of the you know early stage VCs and they all pretty much but laughed at me thinking socks. Well, and, and honestly, the biggest thing is that. The thing that hurt me the most is that I, I went in and being like, I want to build a $50 million business, sell it for $150 million, and then start over again. And they were like, not interesting enough. Like, well, you've got to tell me it's going to be a billion. And I was like, well, uh, I mean, it could be, but like, I'm not going to, like, I want to deliver what I know I could deliver on. So we can talk about VCs and my fundraising uh, journey there uh, separately. But um, so raised a million dollars. Um, during that time period, we'd also been casted um, for the show Shark Tank. So they saw our Indiegogo campaign. They reached out to us uh, in early April 14 and said, do you want to be on the show? We thought it was a joke at first. Um, and we we're like, yeah, of course. Like, sure. Why not? Right? You, you know, if somebody opportunity knocks, you open the door. Yeah. Thinking it would be a total lark, right? Thinking we wouldn't get on the show. Uh, we interviewed, um, and over the summer of 14, they ended up, you know, flying us out to LA. We filmed for the show. We got a deal, but, but, you know, the adage behind it is like, just cause you got a deal and just cause you filmed doesn't mean it's ever going to air. So like go back to business. Don't ever think about this. We'll call you. And when you say you got a deal, what is, what do you mean by that? So we got a deal with one of the sharks. You did. Okay. Yeah. Which one? Uh, Damon. Which one is he? Damon John, uh, co-founder or founder of FUBU. Uh, based in New York, mm-hmm. so apparel background. Mm-hmm. Um, we thought it made the most amount, made most sense to to work with him. Um, always been very, you know, he's kind of grassroots, built it from nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Out of the trunk of his, you know, mom's good, uh, car, and um, I think in the Bronx, um, and built it into a multi billion dollar business. So um, got the deal, but the way that a lot of the sharks work, and you know, and I totally admire and agree with them is they're like let's wait to see if the show actually airs and we had just we were in the middle of fundraising so we didn't need the capital right away and so we're like cool totally you know let's talk about it when something actually materializes uh we close our fundraising round in the beginning of september 14 uh we hire our first uh our second hire which is kate oh wow i didn't know that you, um as our kind of vp of marketing i didn't actually know, she worked with too. you at how about we uh, customer acquisition and um 
the kind of the, the precursor to that was I was at a general assembly event on like kind of ecom 101 uh, and you know a lot of people here's how to start a website and all this stuff and then this guy stands up and his name is Adam Schwartz. He oh, yeah, Adam. was the COO and co-founder of Busted Teas, and then he started Tea Public. Um, he starts talking about cohort analysis and CAC ratio, CAC to LTV ratios, and all this. Stuff. My head is spinning, right? I'm like, I kn- I don't understand a single. It's like it basically <laughs> could have been talking like Japanese to me, uh-huh. and I was, but I knew it was important, and right? I knew this was like a key to like running a very successful like scaled e-commerce business. So I walked up to him at the end, and I was like, I didn't understand a single word you said, but I know that it's really important. Would you join my advisory board of this company that like barely exists? And Adam was super, he's like, look, we don't have to, like, don't, we don't have to do that. I was like, happy to sit down with you, talk you through it. And every time I sat down with him, I was like more and more engaged in like, holy shit, this is so important, but I don't know how to put any of this to work. So I finally convinced him to join our advisory board. And then when we came around to actually hiring, we closed our fundraising round and actually came around to hiring uh, a VP of marketing in kind of the growth and customer acquisition uh, area. Uh, Adam interviewed Kate. I, I kind of been referred to me through Emery. Kate mm-hmm. uh, Emery referred Kate to me, um, and then uh, and I had him interview her. I was like, does you know all that stuff that you talk about? Is she, does she understand it? And he's like, she gets it. Like you should hire her. She's a badass. Like go for it. So we hire her in the beginning of September. Um, we're about to put some money to work in marketing, and our phone rings, and it's Shark Tank, and they're like, you're gonna air on the season premiere of. Shark Tank on September 26th. Um, and so we start like battening down the hatches and being super prepared, gearing up the website and all this stuff. We're like, don't put any money into marketing. We have this huge exposure opportunity. Um, you know, let's get our email flows and, you know, email capture and try to like just in two weeks, like try to, you know, put as many things into place to like, opt, you know, capitalize on this opportunity as possible. Um, so we had done about, so from August 13 through September 14, we've done about 900,000 in sales, all organically, press and you know relationships, and, but just really relying on our core customer base. And then Shark Tank airs, it goes through the roof. Our website crashes a bunch of times. We have so many fulfillment order issues. But over the course of the next two months, we end up doing about 1.2 million of revenue, sell out oh, of all wow. of our product completely uh, two weeks before Christmas. Um, not putting a single dollar into marketing, just like, you know, the flood that came from, uh, from Shark Tank. So that was, that was, an, you know, again, you want to talk about like luck or gifts, like that was a gift for us. Um, and, uh, and, and a total game changer for our business at that time. Um, but yeah, talking about digital marketing, we start off 2015. We now have this massive customer file, tons of momentum, get our inventory back in stock in January. Uh, and that's when we really start to kick off the, you know, uh, digital customer acquisition. And, you know, our, again, our, our, the way that we've approached this whole business is thinking about them as proofs of concepts or, or hypotheses, right? Like set the hypothesis, ask the question, you know, originally it was, do people care about the brand and product and not story enough to buy it without seeing it, right? Ecom. Indiegogo, they bought it. Will they come back? Right? Do they like it enough to come back? And do they like it enough to tell their friends? So that was like hypothesis number two. Hypothesis number three was, okay, can we pay customers to come to the site? And will their behaviors be the same as those who came organically? So if we pay to get them to come in, will once they get the product, will they like it enough to come back? Will they like it enough to tell their friends? Um, and so that was the next hypothesis. And really Kate's, you know, marching orders as our VP of marketing um, for the next kind of iteration of our business. Um, she set out, you know, with kind of, you know, at the time, what she had kind of known and talking with other people in the space, um, you know, what channels should we start with? What should our you know strategy look like? And Facebook was kind of the main game in town. This is early 2015. Um, and so we, Gave her a you know couple hundred thousand dollar marketing budget and said like let's start testing stuff like let's start testing creative let's start testing copy start testing demographics channels um, see what works uh, and then start to really hone the skill and there's a piece of advice in here that I give a lot of entrepreneurs who are kind of going down this journey as well which is you know I talk to a lot of people who are like all right next month we're gonna spend two thousand dollars 
And then if that works, we're going to spend $4,000. And then if that works, we're going to spend eight. Digital marketing is a, is a stats game, right? It's all statistics. It's all data. So whether you decide to spend $100,000 over 12 months or $100,000 over three months, the likelihood is that you're going to get to the, the same answer. So you might as well shorten your time horizon because if you have the capacity to iterate on the creative quickly enough and make the changes and not obviously don't spend $100,000 on the same thing and keep banging your head against the wall, that doesn't work. You've got to spread it out and you've got to try and really be iterative in the process and figure out what's working, what's not working and be super, you know, adapt on the fly and, and you know, start to really distill down the stuff that is start to working and then reinvest in the stuff that is working. Um, but dragging it out over a longer period of time, you're going to end up pretty much getting the same results. And if you start with two or four, you can really end up with a false negative. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not quite Correct. enough to really figure out. Yeah, you need at. a, it's the law of large numbers, right? You need, the larger the data set, the, the more accurate the, uh, the, the the narrower the standard deviations from the mean. So the more accurate the outcome will be. Mm -hmm. So um, I tell people that it is very much a stats game early on and you have to you know put, put money to work um, to figure it out. So 2015, how much revenue did you do? 2015, we scaled. So 2014 was 1.8 million mm -hmm. total. 2015, we scaled to 4.6 million. Mm -hmm. Um, 2016, uh, we closed a Series A round of $3 million, uh, all, again, from angel investors, mostly follow-on, some new, uh, scaled to 17.2. Um, uh, 2017, we scaled to 47.8. 2018, we scaled to 105, and we're on track to pretty much double again this year. And, and, pro and profitable every year. And Yeah, I was going to just say, and you only raised... $4 million. $4 million. That's incredible. It can be done, kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>